Hello, this is Sue Lloyd, Vice Chair of the ISSB, and I'm here with our Chair, Emmanuel Faber, and we're recording this in Frankfurt following our April Board Week. As usual, Emmanuel, shall we start with a check-in on what's been happening since our March Board Meeting? Thank you, Sue. And so, indeed, um, I mentioned in our last podcast uh, that uh, I had been visiting Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. It was a very productive visit, demonstrative uh, of, I think, the real positive and significant support uh, for our work in those uh, countries. I think for the global baseline to work, we obviously need jurisdictions with significant capital markets, uh, but also uh, jurisdictions with smaller markets. And the fact that Nigeria, Kenya, South Africa, but also Egypt are looking at our standards show that uh, they are proportionate enough to be implemented. Also, it shows that regulators have assessed the cost-benefit as a positive equation. And this is in a context where it was striking for me during this visit how much there is a link between the adoption of our standards and trade opportunities. For example, Brazil and some of the African jurisdictions we visited have trade agreements. And as Brazil has stated that it will be making our standards mandatory from 2026, so transparency on both sides may increase trade potential. Many African companies operate in the value chains of companies that will be adopting the ISSB. And so companies and governments are looking at this to facilitate trade and capital flow growth over time. So it was a very positive trip. And from here, we're starting significant capacity building initiatives uh, with partners uh, in organizations in these uh, jurisdictions. But I guess you, you were in Seoul last week. That's right, in Korea. Um, for the International Forum of Accounting Standard Setters, which now indeed also covers sustainability topics as well. And uh, this time we were really lucky to be hosted by the Korean um, Standard Setting Board. Um, and the forum here it provides a place for national standard setters and others interested in financial reporting to discuss current issues in financial reporting. Traditionally, this was an accounting standard setting forum, but they've now expanded, and I think about half of the discussion in the week this time was actually on sustainability reporting, and the other half on a sort of traditional financial statement reporting. So it's a great opportunity to share information on developments in our work, and also to hear how our national standard setters are considering adoption or other use of the ISSB standards. Um, so we provided an update on our digital taxonomy, uh, the uptake of which will really help investors uh, to process uh, information uh, effectively. I was fortunate to participate in a panel discussing uh, the concept of materiality in our standards in anticipation of educational material which we're developing on this topic following our board meeting in February. And finally, we participated in a panel on the adoption of the ISSB standards and interoperability between our standards and the European Sustainability Reporting Standards. While we were there in Korea, it was also a great opportunity to hear directly from Korean authorities, investors and companies about how they are moving forward on their own decisions on sustainability reporting. But another important source of input, input to our work this month was through the meeting of the IFRS Foundation's Advisory Council. So the, you were there, Emmanuel, maybe a few words on that. Yeah, I was. Thank you, Sue. And um, so the, the Advisory Council is the, the formal strategic advisory body of the IFRS Foundation. Uh, it is made up of around 50 experts in the field who advise is extremely useful to inform our work. Um, and it met in London as uh, usual. And so we provided an update on our recent work and on our priorities. It was really useful to hear their advice, emphasizing the need for driving common understanding of our work through bilateral engagement, the importance of educational materials to support the market in key areas, reflection on our plans uh, for the SASB standards and how we plan to enhance those, and on connectivity uh, between the IASB and ISSB. And I guess that probably takes us to uh, this week, where we continued uh, our discussions and decisions on our next two-year work plans. You, you chaired those meetings. That's right. So uh, people listening to this might remember that last month we, in March, we agreed on the balance of our sort of priorities, including our focus um, in the first instance on supporting the implementation 
of our new standards, IFRSS 1 and IFRSS 2, and that our next level of equal focus would be on enhancing the SASB standards and embarking on new research projects. Um, so we decided at this week's meeting to begin uh, two new research projects. First, a project on uh, biodiversity, ecosystems and ecosystem services, and secondly, a research project on human capital. So firstly, maybe a quick reminder on our process. So following consultation on priorities, we always formally begin with what we call a research project, where we assess and define the um, limitations we see with current disclosures in these areas, identify possible approaches to improve disclosures and assess whether standard setting is really necessary and whether it's feasible. And when we find sufficient evidence, then we begin standard setting. Now, I don't want people listening to this and to think that that sounds like a 10 year process. We do need to go through that step, but that can be quite a, a quick process before we move to formal uh, standard setting, but we do need to go through it. I think the second reminder is that uh, disclosure about material information about all sustainability related risks and opportunities that result in material information for a company is already required under IFRS S1 and that companies at the moment are asked to refer to other sources of guidance, including the SASB standards, to determine what disclosures to provide on topics beyond climate. So it's not that we have to do these research projects to get uh, disclosures about biodiversity or human capital. But these projects will enable the ISSB to uh, start its own standard setting work in these key areas. So what the punchline for this work would be, assuming it proceeds to standard setting, would be to establish more specific disclosure requirements as uh, drafted by the ISSB to build out the global baseline of sustainability related uh, financial disclosures on these two new topics. So why these projects? Well, there were a couple of key uh, reasons for what we decided on. Firstly, this is responding to our agenda consultation and through that consultation, our stakeholders, including in particular investors, showed demand, um, the greatest demand for building up the global uh, baseline to meet investor information needs on these topics while also uh, taking into account the costs uh, for preparers. And these uh, topics provide us with a really good opportunity to build from prior work, both our own materials, the SASB standards, the work of the, um, in the CDSB framework, which is now part of the IFRS Foundation, but also there's clear external materials that really give us a good foundation for our focus of our initial research. Uh, so for example, on uh, biodiversity, the work of the TNFD, the Task Force on Nature-Related Financial Disclosures, was um, agreed to by the board as an important anchor to start our thinking in that area. So on the tap, uh, topic of uh, biodiversity, Emmanuel, maybe you could share a little bit about this decision and what this uh, research project will involve and why we decided to prioritise it. Yeah, thank you, Sue. I'm actually delighted that uh, you know, the board finally resolved um, to start a, a project on, on this topic. Uh, I'd just like to remind uh, our audience that uh, we actually produced educational material on uh, some aspects of climate-related uh, risks and opportunities that are related to nature and water and other topics, including just transition. So this integrated nature of so many uh, uh, aspects of business models, um, I think, um, made it um, really interesting that we'd start uh, specific work on this, as many business models are highly dependent on nature including, of course, agriculture, construction, consumer goods, while company impacts on nature are a growing source of regulatory and reputational risks in addition to physical risks and opportunities. So, you know, as I think you would expect from our approach um, of integrated reporting framework and integrated thinking, companies can contribute to and benefit from the preservation, conservation, and restoration of their natural capital. And so an effective management of that process could, for example, increase business resilience due to stability of raw material supply and pricing. And if we produce effective disclosures about this, um, it's possible that companies will um, attract capital at a price that is going to be a competitive advantage. And um, 
all of these aspects um, are pretty intricate, and but they also include um, very specific points such as water, land use, land use change, pollution, resource exploitation, and invasive non-native species. So the feedback we received indicated that there is significant and growing interest among investors for improved disclosure about risks and opportunities related to biodiversity, ecosystems, and ecosystem services that could reasonably be expected to affect a company's prospects. Currently, there is a lack of consistent, comparable information. While there are frameworks being developed and disseminated, they have yet to be widely adopted. And of course, it is important to emphasize that the research projects will assess and define the scope of the project um, and what it will cover specifically. And then our other project will be Human Capital, Sue. Um, can you maybe share a bit about this project and why we agreed to do a project here? Sure. So when we talk about human capital here, we are uh, broadly referring to the people who make up uh, companies' own workforce and workers in the value chain and the workforce's respective competencies, capabilities and experience and motivations to innovate. So human capital considerations that could affect value and an entity's prospects, because that's what we're always tying things to, the value as opposed to values, um, can enhance a company's ability um, to prosper and affect its uh, prospects, as I said, by its effect on how they can attract and retain um, talent, um, whether they've got the right people to design, market and deliver their products and services, the strength of their community relationships, their ability to innovate, whether they're identifying risks, um, and can result in differences in productivity and, of course, can have effects on, on costs. So all of those things are clearly relevant to um, an entity's performance and therefore good candidates for topics of interest to investors. And then there's a number of subtopics that we will, I think, look at and dig into, including worker well-being, diversity, equity and inclusion, employee engagement, um, and labour conditions in the value chain. So we're not just talking about an entity's own employees, which I think was an important part of our conversation as well uh, yesterday. So I think this is going to be a really um, interesting area for us uh, to begin working on. And of course, in deciding to begin these research projects, um, we decided that we would only do two projects, um, these two. And so that meant that we had to make a decision that there would be two other projects that we discuss that we wouldn't uh, move forward. Yeah, Sue, that's right. And uh, thanks for highlighting, um, again, how human capital uh, is going beyond the own workforce, but also ramifications into the, the value chains and its connection to uh, the business model of the company. Um, informed by the market feedback, we indeed decided to not take forward at this time, a project related to risks and opportunities associated with human rights. Uh, however, I just want to clarify, as we did yesterday, of course, that some aspects of human rights may give rise to risks and opportunities that are addressed in other parts of our work plan. And starting with what we said yesterday about the human capital project, where there are definitely human capital related issues um, that are touching in the human rights domain, in particular when it comes to workers' rights and working conditions and other aspects. I would also like to uh, highlight that those topics are addressed on human rights um, on an industry-based basis uh, by the SASB standards, and uh, we have already committed to enhance those. It will be an opportunity to review the overall relevance uh, of the SASB standards uh, to identify and report on material information for investors. For example, we will be looking at risks and opportunities relating to a company's own workforce and workers in its value chain as part of our human capital project that I just said. But I would like to say again, as you flagged earlier in, um, in this report to you, that uh, IFRS S1 already requires that all risks and opportunities need to be reported when they're material, and th that includes human rights. And we are flagging the opportunity for 
uh, guidance um, to be found by companies when they have such uh, a matter um, to, uh, to populate their disclosures in reporting with, for instance, DRI or the ESRS. So this is simply to say that it's not because we are not uh, starting a project on this topic, like in any other topic, by the way, that we are not actually already uh, covering that topic with um, IFRS S1, which has such a comprehensive um, um, ramification. We have also uh, decided that we won't uh, be taking forward at that time a project on integration in reporting. While not a substitute, both the SSB and ISB support the use of uh, the integrated reporting framework as a resource that drives high quality corporate reporting and a cohesive information package for investors. And furthermore, we will uh, not only continue um, to guide and encourage the use of the integrated reporting framework, but we will also closely monitor developments in these important areas and may consider including them in a future agenda consultation. So overall, it was a, I think, very important week. Um, you know, I remember the very first exchanges uh, that we had in preparation of the request for information nearly a year ago, and uh, or more than a year ago, actually. And, and then um, I think it's great because we'll be setting out the decision we've taken and our two-year uh, work plan in our feedback statement uh, in June now. And to looking ahead, uh, what key other milestones are coming up? Yes, a uh, couple of impor uh, important things. So firstly, hopefully on the 30th of um, April, we'll publish the IFRS Sustainability Disclosure Taxonomy, so the ISSB taxonomy, which is a critical milestone in enabling the digital consumption of sustainability-related disclosures. So a really good opportunity for people to get started on the digital reporting journey right from the start um, when you're using our standards. So well done to our staff on that front. Um, we're also um, moving ahead on some educational material, including um, getting close to publishing some materials on current and anticipated financial effects. And also, very excitingly for me personally, given the amount of time I've spent on it, um, the interoperability guidance with um, uh, EFRAG we're progressing really well on this, on our joint educational material, which will explain to companies how to comply with both ISSB standards and European sustainability reporting standards, with a particular focus on our climate disclosures, so that companies know how to do that in a way which reduces the duplication in reporting and reduces complexity for companies that are choosing or mandated to apply both our standards and ESRS. So that's a very exciting moment, but hopefully it's not too far away. Thanks you for um, you know you and the team steering this uh, really important uh, aspect of our agenda over the last uh, nearly two years now, um, and all the best for the conclusion of this process. Uh, next month we will be back in Montreal for our May meeting. The team has just opened our permanent office there. Uh, we are really grateful to CPA Canada for providing temporary office space for us over the last couple of years. Uh, we are really looking forward as a team to see uh, all together that new space and meeting with our local stakeholders in, uh, in Canada. So thank you all for listening to us. Um, stay tuned and we'll be back from Montreal next month.